Thank you for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1981 film, The Beyond. It is a Lucio Fulci film. And if you don't know, if you didn't watch the first uh, review in this trilogy series I'm doing, I am doing the entire Gates of Hell trilogy by Lucio Fulci. The first one was City of the Living Dead. That's already posted on my channel. This is the second installment, The Beyond. And then I will be doing the third, which is the, the House in the Cemetery so look forward to that one. So I'm going to be able to do some comparisons here. So uh, a little bit of the information I already had in the beginning of the one for um, City of the Living Dead. So it's a little bit repeating, but shouldn't be too much. Written and directed by Lucio Fulci. This film, uh, he also did Don't Torture a Duckling, Zombie, The New York Ripper, and A Cat in the Brain. Uh, a bunch of those I actually haven't seen yet because... City of the Living Dead was the very first Lucio Fulci uh, film I've seen. Now this, The Beyond, is the second, but I'm going to keep going. Don't worry. Uh, it was also written by Dardano Sacchetti, or Sacchetti. I don't know how to say the last name. I'm not sure. I'm going to say Sacchetti. Uh, he's, he's written Demons, Demons 2, 1990, The Bronx Warriors, which is on Shudder. The Scorpion with Two Tails, A Bay of Blood and Cat of Nine Tails, also on Shudder. That's an Argento film, so you know the directing's good. Uh, also written in portion by Giorgio Mariuzzo, uh, who also was involved in writing some of The House by the Cemetery. Sorry, before I said The House in the Cemetery, it is The House by the Cemetery. This, uh, The Beyond is the second installment in the Gates of Hell trilogy. Obviously, it's City of the Living Dead that came out in 1980, then The Beyond and The House by the Cemetery, which both came out in 1981, which I feel like is kind of a really fast turnaround for completing that trilogy. But, hey, you do what you want. Uh, the film was shot in and around New Orleans, and then they had some of the, you know, other shots, especially internals, done in Rome, in a studio in Rome, Italy. It's an Italian film. It's dubbed over, much like City of the Living Dead. Um, that typical time frame, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, there were Italian horror films that were just being shot and immediately dubbed in English. So if you can't stand, not, you know, lips not matching up, Sorry, this film's not for you then, or any of these. Uh, it was released in the United States at, with the title of Seven Doors of Death, with different music and several minutes cut out of it. Uh, its original cut was actually shown in 1998 then by Quentin Tarantino by his grand, Grindhouse, uh, I think it's Grindhouse Releasing or Releases or something like that, not like Grindhouse, picture, Grindhouse Pictures. I don't know, but at any rate, the version on Shudder that I watched, and it is available on Shudder at the moment, the version on Shudder is the Grindhouse one from Quentin Tarantino's company that was from 1998. So, thank you, Quentin Tarantino, for being a steward of these films, trying to get them in their original form. Uh, it was also released in Germany under the title The Ghost Town of Zombies, which is like a terrible, terrible name. <laughs> I mean, is uh, Seven Doors of Death... Yeah, Seven Doors of Death is better. But why didn't they just call it The Beyond wherever they go? This is such, like, a weird thing to me where the titles just change based on the country. I mean, I know it's, like, a marketing thing, but eh, it just seems weird. This is actually considered to be, uh, from what I've read online, considered to be one of Fulci's best films, which I liked it, but I, I liked City of the Living Dead more, to be honest. Uh, so for me, it does not resonate as one of his best films, and I've only seen two of his films now, so I don't know. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going on. I've heard Don't Torture a Duckling is really good, so I have a feeling that's going to be one of his best films most likely, but you know. And Fulci, I'm learning just through two films. Fulci is a uh, style over, over substance type filmmaker, which I enjoy from time to time. Um, as long as the visuals are done really well. And I do think he does a good job with visuals. He also has some cool, very inspired scenes, especially around like deaths and, and uh, you know, interesting paranormal stuff that happens just like in this film. Real quick, I am doing spoilers for this because it's an old film. I, I feel like I always have to say that. Um, it was intended for the trilogy to be, quote, connected by the trope of hapless mortals literally living on top of an entrance to hell and then inadvertently falling into it. I mean, that's the story, the plot for City of the Living Dead and The Beyond. I assume it's going to be the same for The House by the Cemetery. And like I said, these films are light on story. These films are very light on story. 
it's about the visuals, it's about the gore, it's about the music, it's about anything but story, pretty much. It's super light. So it's rumored, no surprise here, it's rumored that Fulci didn't have a full script for this film when he started shooting it. He just had an outline that he was working from. And if you know that information and you go into the film watching it, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. Because it, it just seems kind of aimless in the way it's put together. It's kind of like, okay, now we'll do this, now we'll do this, now we'll do this. Um, there's no story. There, there's almost no story. I mean, there is there is like an actual story, and it does tie into City of the Living Dead, but it's, it's so loose. It's such like a broad idea of a story that doesn't get into too many specifics, and so it it's almost like it's not there, to be honest. Fabio Frizi did the score for this film, and it is a very good score. And in fact, it was ranked by Rolling Stone magazine as the 11th best horror film score. And this is something that they ranked in 2016, so almost, you know, four years old at this point. But uh, the 11th best horror film score. It is a really good score, and I kind of feel like I don't want to say I feel like it was wasted on this film because I just, I don't know. I just feel like the score is better than the film is. Like, the film itself underperforms for how good the score is. The score should have been in the backdrop of something much better, much more interesting. Something more like, like Argento's Deep Red or something like that. I mean, he has great scores anyway, but, you know, something in the same vein of, like, the same good writing as, like, Deep Red. Uh, this film was put on the Video Nasties list in the UK. No big surprise here when you see the amount of gore in it, especially the uncut version. So, it happens. Uh, everything is is a vintage yellow in the beginning of this film, which is, a, in my opinion, a really cool way to kind of replicate the look of old photos as they've aged. You know, really old photos, the black and white ones, turn very, very yellow as they get older. And I think, I'm just speculating here, I think that was kind of the intent of starting the film as uh, that yellow color to kind of make that that comparison, to draw that parallel. And I say that because it's set in the past. It's giving you the backstory on, you know, there was this person here who was using the Book of Aben and he was doing this demonic kind of painting and there's a gate of hell here and then he was killed and yeah, you know. We, we all know. We've watched it. But I'll talk more specifics. But I just thought that was cool, that, that kind of color usage. And you don't see that color used, like, at all. Like, this is the first time I've seen anyone do a scene in that, like, yellow coloration. But I thought it was cool. The beating, uh, the opening beating and brutality gives you the signal that uh, it'll be ramping up gore considerably in this film, especially in comparison to City of the Living Dead. Uh, and that's a long take of a face melt, to be honest, when that guy who's doing the painting gets killed. First, he's like getting beaten with the chain and it's very gory. And then I was just like, oh, man, they're really stepping up the, the brutality, violence and gore. And then it goes like even further and they're like throwing the acid on him. And it just like sits there and makes you watch like his face getting melted. Not to, you know, not to even say that like the crucifixion was really, really graphic as well. And I mean... Practical effects in this were quite good, uh, for the most part. Although I will talk about one of the practical effects thing. I was, I was just like, okay, but you know, we'll talk about that in a minute. But that face melt scene was pretty long. They they probably should have cut that down because it just seemed like it took a little too long. Not from like a gross out fact uh, standpoint, just timing wise. It's like I'm getting a little bored of watching this. Um, there are plenty of shady looking and acting characters in this film, especially in the beginning, like, the, the caretakers of the house, Martha and Arthur, like, they're just crazy, crazy shady. And they also kind of, like, don't have emotions, really, in this film, which is really, really weird. Especially when, um, I, I, I got the idea, I don't think it was explicitly said, but, like, Joe the Plumber, who shows up, he seems like he's, like, Martha's husband or something. Like, they have some sort of close bond. But then when she finds his body... She's like, she no reaction to it. So, like, some of these characters are very poorly written and poorly thought out. And that's why it kind of makes sense, the rumor of, you know, Fulci not actually having a full script. But, I, I mean, regardless of that, I would think that when Martha finds Joe's body, that he would just be like, you have to act like this is a terrible thing. You have to scream and nothing. She's just like, meh, 
Yeah, another body. Well, what are you going to do? It's like, what the hell? Uh, the hand popping out of the wall and taking Joe's eye out when in the scene where he gets killed is really good. Well, first of all, the basement. Like, that flooded basement looks super creepy. Uh, they did a really good job making it look the way it needed to in that. And it's, like, super, super flooded. C great, great scenery. Uh, and then the moment when, like, the, the wall kind of, like, the water takes the wall away. And then... I mean, that was creepy enough. And then, like, the hand flying out and, like, popping Joe's eye out. I was like, oh, man. And that scene looked really good. Like, that effect of the eyeball being pulled out would definitely make some people squirm. Um, yeah, like I said, I like how Martha finds Joe's body. It's just like, man. Uh, Emily was actually not able to see during this film. Uh, I had to let you know. Uh, the Emily, the, the blind girl who had, you know, you see her eyes close up and they're just, like, totally... Um, I think it's like, it looks a little yellowish, but I think it's just supposed to be like white over her uh, corneas and retina and, or cornea and pupil, sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I think that's, I think it's supposed to be white, but it looks like kind of yellow. So they hand painted those contact lenses apparently and her and then later on the kid and I think a few other people had to have them in and they legitimately could not see. Like they could not see past the paint in there and... That would be kind of rough to work with on a set, to be honest. Not just from the standpoint of the actors, but from the standpoint of the director as well. Fulci probably had a hard time because, you know, you got to keep people safe, too. Why would they hook a six-year-old dead body up to a heart monitor? That's one of the things in this film that does not make any sense. When they find the old body of the painter um, who's all messed up and in really good shape, they make a statement that it's a six-year-old dead body. But for some reason in the morgue, they have it hooked up to a heart monitor, which like I get it for the visuals of the film. And it gives you that moment of like, oh, it's coming to life because it shows like the heartbeat on the monitor at one point. But it makes absolutely no sense. Why would you hook a six year old dead body up to a heart monitor? It's stupid. So there are some of those things in the film that are just like, huh? The squeaking gurney in this film in, in the morgue is way too much. Um, it is crazy ear piercing. Uh, I had to turn the volume down really fast on that. It legitimately hurt my ears. My cat freaked out because she didn't know what that noise was. And it is so shrill. It is so piercing. They needed to take that down quite a bit. They really needed to take that down. Uh, the girl at the morgue, the redheaded girl, uh, I didn't understand when she, like, busts in when her mom got the, uh, like, she got, I guess she got, like, knocked out and then, like, the acid uh, bottle tips over and she, um, and it's, like, going on her face and it's melting her face. Like, the girl just stands there. She's just, like, standing there watching it and she's just, like, wouldn't you, like, first of all, wouldn't you do something? Like, if that's your mother, which they're, that's what they were saying, insinuating is that was her mother, like, you would go and try to help, or you would run for help, or you would do something. She just stands there and stares at her mom's face being melted, and I'm just like, this, another moment, makes no sense. Makes no <laughs> sense. Fulci is not big on actual story, man, I'll tell you. Uh, you might not want to continue to pursue turning the house into a hotel when two people die the very first day that you're there. That's another thing. Liza, the main character, Liza, she's trying to remake this house into this nice hotel. It, it originally was a hotel, but she's trying to like, you know, revamp it, renovate it and make it a hotel again. But when two people die, I, I'm assuming the painter who fell off the scaffolding dies because he was like, you know, vomiting up a lot of blood. There was a lot of blood coming out of his mouth. And people also seemed to not really be freaking out about that. They were just like, oh, I'm calling the doctor. Don't worry. Okay. And like, meanwhile, he's losing tons of blood on their couch, nonetheless. So I'm assuming these two people died because him and Joe. And so wouldn't you kind of like put things on hold or reevaluate what you're doing if two people die the very first day you're there? That I would. I didn't get the whole Emily thing, by the way. Why would Liza just take her to her place? Um, and why? And she starts treating her like like a friend immediately. And the way they meet is, is like totally odd. You know, she's driving down this road and she's standing in the middle of the road with her seeing eye dog. And this person who doesn't know you, Liza, is just like, oh, hey, 
I'll help you out. Like, I understand the aspect of she's blind, she's lost. Help her out. Like, I get that. That's fine. But then she's just, like, treats her like she's a friend immediately. And she, like, comes into her house. And then all of a sudden she's talking about her like, oh, she's my friend. Like, the friendship aspect just came out of nowhere. It was so forced. Once again, not good writing if there was writing regarding that at all. So it's just weird. Uh, you gotta love the fake tarantulas. The f the tarantula scene was a cool idea, and it worked to a degree. But you can see where there's real tarantulas, but then there's the fake ones. And the fake ones just move just like... They just, like, teeter from side to side. And it looks so funny and stupid. Um, and the noise. The noise of them moving is so over the top. And that's one of the things with this film. The sound design is not that good in the sense of, like, the Foley work. Like using a sound of, like, crunching gravel for the tarantulas walking is very mismatched. Uh, the, the crazy shrieking of the gurney is way too much. That was overdone, and it was just not good. Um, so I wrote down that I thought the tarantula scene was very, very laughable. I did laugh out loud at this scene because it is extremely laughable, especially with how long... The scene goes on. It's another one of those moments of just it goes on too long. And this is something that happened throughout the film, just stretching these scenes too long. It's something that happened in City of the Living Dead as well. I guess it's just a Fulci thing. So, like, eh. The nail through the back of the head scene and pushing out the eyeball is quite a good one. I think that was, that was Martha, I believe, when she finally got it, which she deserves it for not reacting appropriately to Joe being dead. When, like, he's got her face and he, like, shoves her head up against the nail sticking out of the wall. And it just, like, goes in the back of her head and it pops out the front and her eyeballs at the end of it. That's a great scene. That's really inspired. Looks outstanding. They did such a good job putting that one together. And that's one of the things with this. Like I said, like, the gore looks good in the film. The practical effects are good. There are inspired moments, inspired scenes to it. And that's one of them. It's funny that Emily's dog is named, I think, Dickie. I think that's what it sounds like. And it's also funny that he bites her throat out and the amount of blood that just comes gushing out is over the top. It's kind of comical, but it makes it funny and fun. And I actually like that. It was just like, bleh, bleh, bleh. it just kept going. And I was just like, hmm, yeah. And then, uh, you just, I mean, I'm sure she didn't expect to have her dog turn around on her and just rip her throat out. But the other thing is, like, she was telling her dog to attack these zombies. Like, she had to know it wasn't actually going to work, you know? And also, does she actually love that dog? Because if she did, she'd just cut him loose and she'd be like, well, I know I'm going to die. Dog might as well get away. She, like, tries to sacrifice it for herself. What a jerk. I'm glad he ripped her throat out. Uh, and then where's this dude getting all these bullets? The the guy who's who's fighting against the zombies at the end in the in the, in the morgue as they just keep coming at him and just keep shooting these, his revolver keeps regenerating bullets magically. The other thing is the effect that they use for the bullets. It just looks like they just splattered a little bit of paint. Like it's just like a dot of red pretty much on when, especially when they do the headshots, like it doesn't look good to be honest. And they sh just keep showing him shooting over and over and over. It's another one of those things where they just keep going and going and going. And it's like, okay, we get the point. We're done with this now. It doesn't even look that good. And there's no way he still has bullets. You ran out of bullets a long time ago, buddy. Attention to detail. Um, so again, just like City of the Living Dead, it's a slow, overly drawn out ending. Uh, but the girl getting her head blown off looked really good. And it was unexpected. The girl with the red hair that then ends up having her eyes glaze over. Uh, I did not see it coming when her head just goes, which that guy didn't even have the bullets to do that, but whatever, <laughs> you know, like, but like I said, it was slow, overly slow, totally drawn out. City of Living Dead, the exact same thing. They, the endings seem very similar between the two films too. Uh, I do like how they end up in the landscape at the end. That was like the landscape that was in the painting that this, you know, demonic painter was, was doing from inspiration from the book of Aben. Um, I like that the that they they try and roll in more of a role with the Book of Aben into this one as opposed to City of the Living Dead. In City of the Living Dead, it's just kind of like, hey, there's this book, okay. <laughs> and in this one, they try to you know put more of the Book of Aben lore into it, 
and I think that worked a little bit better, but, you know, still so light. All right, so let's talk about some thematic stuff and whatnot. So since there are seven Gates of Hell, I actually assume they could have made four more movies in this trilogy. It would have been a trilogy at that point, but they could have made four more movies than they did because they even say in the film that there are seven Gates of Hell. So I'm like, hmm, maybe someone can pick this up nowadays and go with it. Although it might be done in comics because I know there's a comic company called Aben Press that is going off a bunch of Fulci uh, stuff. So I don't know if they're working with the Gates of Hell um, storyline. If they are, that'd be pretty cool, and I might actually want to check that out. The final film scenes were supposed to actually be shot in an amusement park initially, but the logistics of actually getting it done were so tough that they decided to take a pass on it. Um, the music was one of the best things about this film. Uh, like we already talked about, the music by Fabio Frizi, really, really good, excellent. The sound design, like I was saying, is so off. Uh, there are noises that are too over the top for what they're supposed to be. The tarantulas we already talked about. The insane popping noise during the blood that's raining down in the basement scene. It's so off for what it is. Like I was saying, the Foley work is just not matching the scene. And then like we talked about, that ear-piercing, squeaking gurney. Totally inappropriate. No way. Uh, like City of the Living Dead, there are lots of interestingly framed shots and nice fluid camera movements and panning. So it looks really good. It's very cool. But I feel like it also just borrowed a lot of stuff from City of the Living Dead. I mean, some some prime examples, even though they're kind of small. Uh, an exploding window. They use basically the exact same thing there. Uh, also, in City of the Living Dead, when there's an ex exploding window and then the glass is sticking in the wall and then it starts bleeding... They did the exploding window in the beyond, and then they also did, like, the painting bleeding just like the wall was bleeding. So they just kind of, like, reused some stuff. So for that reason, I actually didn't really like the beyond as much as I liked City of the Living Dead, to be honest. But I still liked the beyond. I thought it was good. So, but like I said, you know, there's not a whole lot story-wise. So out of five stars, with half stars in play, I'm going to give it three stars. Uh, I believe I gave City of Living Dead three and a half. I'm going to go three on the beyond. And we will see where the House by the Cemetery ends up coming in on this. Uh, I know that that is actually the most profitable one of the three, I believe. So I don't know if that translates to it actually being better or not, but we'll find out. So hopefully everyone enjoyed this. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the review for City of the Living Dead. And if you haven't seen it, go go watch it. It's on my channel. Put some comments down here. What are your thoughts about this film or all the films, to be honest? Uh, and then please hit that subscribe if you're not already subscribed. If you are subscribed, hit the like just to let me know you're still watching. Um, and if you're not subscribed, please hit the subscribe because that motivates me to keep it going because I don't make money doing this or anything. And you can also hit the like if you want to as well. So, But anyway, thanks everyone for checking this one out. And until next time, keep it brutal.